Hello, you're listening to the Close Encounters podcast. Welcome to episode number eight. Yes, we are back after an unintentional break. Sometimes life just gets in the way. But in this episode, we will cover some of the interesting news articles I've found over the past week. And then I'll be speaking to a fantastic brother and sister team from the United States. They host a podcast of their own and have some of their own experiences to share. You don't want to miss that. Unfortunately, though, we had a couple of technical glitches during the recording. and The introduction seems to be a little bit messed up somehow and then i had somebody uh, with the audacity to call me halfway through um uh, the interview madness so uh, apologies for that unfortunately i couldn't really edit that too well but you know without any further delay let us go straight into the news with the section of that's what i call news Yes, uh, so this is the section that I call, that's what I call news. It's my selection of the uh, interesting and paranormal things that I found around the world over the past week. And I guess we can get it started off with the footage of a jellyfish UFO from 2008 has just been released. You can find this on YouTube and footage leaked by filmmaker and UFO investigator Jeremy Corbell appears to show an unidentified flying object being dubbed the jellyfish UFO due to its unusual appearance. The footage shows an object that to me looks similar to the Imperial probe droid that we first seen in uh, The Empire Strikes Back casually glide over a US Joint Operations Base in Iraq. It is the latest video to set the UFO community a buzz. I suppose it's akin to the famous Tic Tac UFO that was released a couple of years ago. Uh, and I've seen this footage and I must say it is rather astonishing. Uh, the object, officially designated a UAP by the US Department of Defense, was seen traversing the secure compound before reportedly being observed making a controlled descent, in quotes, into a body of water and after about 17 minutes I was going to say 15 but it's 17 minutes uh, emerged from the water and shot off at an incredible speed. Um, you, you've got to see this footage for yourself if you haven't already it is absolutely phenomenal and uh, if any of you would like to see it of course as always a link will be provided in the show notes and can be found on our Facebook page Moving on to naturalsociety.com, a research breakthrough on weight loss by the North Carolina State University. Now, if you are one of many who has set a New Year's resolution to shift those extra pounds and you're already struggling, then this might be the solution for you. And professor and nutrition specialist Caroline Dunn from the North Carolina University and a team of researchers study the effects of mindful eating over the course of 15 weeks. And uh, it, it found it had an effective method, or it was an effective method, uh, for losing weight without sacrificing your favourite foods. Now, where probably already sounds too good to be true, the 15-week programme encourages participants to focus on various aspects of what they're consuming, from savouring the taste, the texture, and planning your meal times. The only caveat is to this method is that they insist that you focus on eating your food and nothing else. So you're being divested of distractions of the television, uh, phones, music, etc., you have to focus solely on eating your food and the experience that goes with it. I must say it's an interesting take on it and if you're interested in reading more or giving it a go, uh, the link will be provided in the show notes. Let us go over to the west coast <laughs> in the United States, coast to coast AM. Coming back to UFOs, a private pilot has reported seeing a 30 foot tall triangular UFO. Uh, now, in December of last year, a recording of a conversation between an air traffic control tower and a private pilot flying from Pittsburgh to Maryland in the United States has revealed that the pilot has witnessed, uh, or he did witness, uh, a fast-traveling triangular-shaped UFO that was approximately 30 feet tall. The audio clip, which can be found on YouTube and included in the link in the show notes, allows us to hear a clear description uh, from what the pilot had saw. Though observed from a distance, the pilot felt compelled to report it and uh, has stated that he had taken a picture, although I've yet to find the picture that was allegedly taken. Haven't been able to find it yet, but um, um, maybe that will materialise 
at some point in the near future. Uh, although, interestingly, in the YouTube comments, a user going by the name of Adam Wright 3346 uh, has claimed that he lives right in the area the incident had taken place. And shortly after that incident, some uh, US Air Force jets were uh, active in the area. Interesting story, and I would encourage you to check it out uh, on uh, Coast to Coast AM. And finally, uh, we go over to Space.com uh, with the title, The First Private Mission to Venus uh, is to Search for Signs of Life. Now, if you remember, at the turn of the decade, it was announced that potential signs of life had been detected high in the atmosphere of Venus. Well... In the year 2025, Rocket Lab, a private rocket launch provider, had stated that they intend to fly a mission to Venus in the hopes of confirming the sulfuric acid droplets in the atmosphere can stably host complex biochemicals that are needed to trigger life. So, while not quite the uh, Phoenicians uh, as described by George Adamski, it certainly will be groundbreaking uh, uh, news and uh, a groundbreaking moment uh, for our sciences if this is uh, confirmed to be true. As always, the link will be provided in the show notes below. And that is the end of the news section. Let us move on to the interview. <laughs> Okay, so I have a brother and sister team all the way from Austin in Texas, and they are the hosts of the We Believe Do You podcast, which explores uh, the accounts of real people regarding their paranormal experiences uh, and uh, their theories behind it. You can catch their new episodes of their podcast each Wednesday on major podcast platforms, and I have got them both here. Uh, Eric and Michelle, how do you do? It's uh, still early morning. Yeah, I was just going to say it must still be early morning for you. Yeah, uh, it's coming towards the late afternoon here. Um, massive, massive time difference. But thank you for joining me, uh, going out of your way to be here. Um, I'm aware that you've been both uh, interested in the paranormal for some time now. And most, if not all of us, uh, have had something that piqued our interest in the paranormal, like a sighting or television program, etc. W- what was it that piqued your interest? Uh, I think we always mention this, our watching unsolved mysteries uh with our uncle i don't know if you guys if you all had that in the uk but uh it was this program that it dealt with true crime it dealt with ufos it dealt with paranormal uh encounters and stuff like that and it was a show that we would watch with him uh in, during the summers or if we were sick and we, we were staying with him uh while our parents were at work uh we'd be watching that and it was like just one of the daily routines during the summer was that was one of the shows that we would watch and uh i think that was probably one of the things and then the other thing was you know later in the evening whenever x files would come on we would watch that with our father so uh that's kind of where our i guess interest for the paranormal uh peaked yeah, I mean the X Files. I haven't, I didn't watch that until very later in life. Something that I've I've seen now and again. If I was channel hopping as a kid, uh, even the opening credits scared the hell out of me. You know that ghostly figure walking <laughs> yeah. down the hallway really, uh, really scared me. But yeah, it wasn't until later years when it was free on Amazon Prime. I thought, well, let's go on a marathon. <laughs> so yeah. That's what it was. Uh, and Michelle, what about you? Yeah, I mean, I think it's definitely the the same thing. It was a lot of, I, I, but even the you know kids channels like Nickelodeon. We had Are You Afraid of the Dark mm-hmm. and uh, you know in elementary school reading books like Goosebumps. But I mean, I feel like at that point, the paranormal bug we like we had already been bit by the paranormal bug. So once I started to learn how to read, then those were the you know books I was checking out. Is did it have to do with a ghost? Was there an alien in it? Like paranormal cryptids. Um, those were my favorite books to read. Uh, so yeah, I'm not sure what about it. Um, in particular, I guess the mystery of it kind of just, I wanted answers and I wanted to to read all I could about it as well. I think that is what draws a lot of people in, isn't it? It's the sort of the, the mystery or the things that can't be seen, the unexplained. I mean, that's one of the things that certainly drew me into the paranormal. It just, um, it ignites the imagination, you know, and it, it, it can be really exciting. And a lot of people love to be scared. I don't care who you are. Yeah. Everyone <laughs> loves to be scared. Um, yeah. you know, I, I, my, I myself and, you know, um, 
things like that don't really scare me as much. There's a few things that do, but everyone goes for the thrill, don't they? Yeah. So, mm-hmm. uh, have you either of you had any paranormal experiences yourselves? Uh, you know that you'd like to share with us, or is it just an interest? No. <laughs> do you want to go first, Jerry? <laughs> um. Yeah, it, it's it's been a lot of paranormal experiences but i guess to kind of go off of our show the one of the first ones that i can remember very vividly uh was so actually in this room me and michelle uh well you guys can't see us but in the room that i'm recording in right now uh michelle and i used to share this bedroom uh, as kids and we had twin beds and um i remember her door was her bed was the one that was a little bit closer to the door but i had like a more you know, I could see the door and see out the room uh, through that door. And I remember laying, I was laying in bed and the door, we used to sleep with the door open. And I remember waking, like kind of waking up and still kind of being in a groggy state. And all of a sudden I just saw this figure uh, standing in the doorway. Uh, It was, the best way I can describe it is it did have like, I guess a, person's silhouette almost or like just maybe like you know that generic ghost with the, like the white sheet ghost type of thing yeah i yeah. guess picture that and then but instead of being white it was uh like just colors uh like if you were looking at the light spectrum and it's just going all the colors of the spectrum uh in like this rainbow bright you know light but it scared me because I was a kid. I was maybe 10, 11 years old and I was freaking out because I said, I was thinking, what is this? And I remember trying to call out to my parents um, and I couldn't get my, like my voice would not, it wasn't working. I was trying to scream and I couldn't, and I was just paralyzed. I guess people could say that it's, uh, it was a sleep paralysis. Um, but I remember I was finally able to yell and I called out for my parents and I remember my, I heard my parents get up out of bed and start running towards our room. And then as soon as my dad kind of like burst through the, the doorway, uh, and I guess walked through the, what I was seeing, it kind of just like disappeared and they they came to me and they were like, are you okay? What's going on? This and that. And, and I, I, I want to say that I told them what I saw and I can't remember what their response would have been, but I know that's, that's the first one that really sticks in my head. I'm sure there was other things before that, but that's the the main one that I can remember that I all, I know I'll never forget. Like, did, did you feel threatened by its presence or was it literally just a yeah. moment of just freeze, you know? Yeah, I, I don't think it was necessarily that I was like it caused me to be afraid. It's just because I didn't know what it was and I'm seeing this figure standing in my doorway when we're not supposed to, you know, we're supposed to be asleep. It's It, it was the middle of the night. Uh, that's what scared me. Uh, so, yeah, it's not necessarily that it was creating that fear. It's just I guess because it was unknown and it wasn't supposed to be there that freaked me out. And I mean, that's still something to this day that I kind of deal with. Like I, if I've seen things that aren't supposed to be there, I, I really have to kind of fight that uh, panic, you know, like uh, urge to start freaking out. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> I suppose it goes back to what we were saying uh, earlier, whenever we were talking on your podcast, about sort of similar to my experience you know, seeing something that shouldn't be there scares the hell mm-hmm. out of you. And the first thing that you do is call for your parents, you know. Um, of course. But although mine wasn't colourful, mine was just, like, black or, or shadowy, you know. Fascinating right. that we've had, like, a sort of similar experience in similar circumstances, you know, mm-hmm. looking up from a sleep just to, to look out the window. Um, in my case, that was looking out the window. That's absolutely right. terrifying, I would think. If you don't know yeah. what it is, especially as a kid... My God, you know, what would you do? Um, mm-hmm. what, what about you, Michelle? Because uh, I know you've been into the paranormal longer than your brother. Yeah. Um, so I, 
I struggle, I guess, with, with this. And, and part of me also is like all the paranormal things that I had happen as an adult. Part of me wants to say like, oh, it was just a dream. But I think that comes from a little bit of fear or admitting that something actually happened. Uh, but this one, they're just so clear that it's like, how can it? Yeah. Anyway, so my I guess my very first paranormal experience that I could remember was... Um, and somehow I got very nervous, even though we've been recording already for <laughs> like an hour and a half. So apologies if my voice is a little shaky. But uh, we, yeah, we had this two-story house, um, and I had this doll that I was like a you know Barbie doll. I was looking for, and I couldn't find her. Um, and we had this schnauzer at the time that if we left toys on the floor, she would just destroy them, chew them up, and that was kind of the case uh, is what ended up happening with this doll that I was looking for and I saw the doll at the bottom of the steps uh it like literally looked like a movie with a spotlight on it and everything <laughs> kind of thing with the, the light that we had at the bottom of the steps so I go down I pick her up and she yeah she did look a little creepy now because her head was all mangled and whatnot and then I heard help me like in a female voice and my child brain thought that it was the doll speaking. So I threw it and like ran up the stairs. And at the time, my brother and my cousin were were in the, the bedroom that Eric is talking about, actually. Uh, and they were playing video games. So I like burst into the door and was like, why did you guys do that? You scared me. Uh, you know, you? and they're completely confused. They have absolutely no idea what I was talking about. And the other thing, too, is that there is no way that I wouldn't have seen them get back into the room, sit down and like sit in front of the TV with with the, you know, controllers because of the way our stake our staircase is built and stuff. Um so one, I feel like Eric would have admitted to admitted to this by now. Um second, it was a female's voice and now I'm thinking it wasn't obviously so much the the doll that was speaking but just a disembodied voice that I was hearing that happened to you know, coincide with me picking up the doll or because I was by myself downstairs. Um, and I mean, we'll get into it. The house that we grew up into, we've we've had, you know, lots of, of things happen. So we, we do believe that there is something in the house, what it was, like we have no idea. We've never really tried to figure it out, but I mean, we've had uh, quite a few, but I think that was probably the first one is just hearing a, a female disembodied voice saying, help me. Uh, and then thinking it was my doll, but I don't, I don't think it it was at this point, because um, she wasn't some creepy porcelain doll. It was just like a regular old Barbie doll, just had been mangled by a dog. Yeah, I mean, um, I don't really know of dolls being capable of speaking. Uh, yeah, you know, um, unless it was like Toy Story or something like that. You know, they come alive when we don't look at them, and <laughs> do you know. But I don't know what would be scarier. You know, seeing something that you don't know. Or hearing something uh, coming from somewhere you can't explain. It, you know, it's yeah. it both equally as terrifying when you think about it. Um, you know, how how did how did you cope with that? Like the day after. I mean, I'd be terrified to go back into that room uh, if I was that age. You know, how how what was your coping mechanism to sort of um, you know, go back your normal routine in your room or something like that? You know. Yeah, I. Oh, well, I mean, as far as like seeing that, I can't remember. I mean, I don't think I, I really, I personally don't remember having any issues going back, but it, it, and it might've been that my parents were just like, oh, you know, you were just dreaming or something like that. You know, the typical thing that the parents say, I, like I said, I can't remember what they said, but it must've been something like that because I I don't remember having any issues coming back in. And I think the fact that my sister was in the room with me as well, like it, it kind of, you know, comforted me a little bit. Uh, well, granted, she is younger than me, but uh, sometimes for me, just being alone in a room in the dark was was enough to terrify me as a kid. You know what I mean? Um, so I think I don't think it was it was much of an issue. But I do know that I was I was very afraid of the dark up until my I would say early twenties. <laughs> um, as as embarrassing it is as it is to admit that. Um, that was the case for me, especially with, with as many things as I had seen, heard, and felt um, to that point. You know what I mean? 
Yeah, I mean, I mean kids, yeah, we do have a really active imagination, don't we? And that does run away with us. Um, mm -hmm. And it doesn't really help with the fear. I mean, I was afraid of the dark up until uh, probably my mid-teens, you know. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, sorry, Michelle, I'd cut you off there whenever I was just reminiscing there. But yeah, please carry on. I don't know. Uh, no, I was just gonna say because uh, I was it was a great question of like how did you guys deal after having these experiences and and I was thinking about that too like I um, you know a couple of other things that that happened in that room as well I remember um, waking up one night and then feeling like a, a an impression in the bed as if someone had sat you know we had kind of lost a cat I think right around that time. And I remember a friend of mine trying to make me feel better saying that it was my cat that came and laid in my bed, even though she never did that. But um, yeah, so I remember, you know, waking up and seeing like the like the indention as if someone was sitting at the, the end of my at the feet of my bed, basically, or the foot of my bed. Um, and another time I used to sleep with a big like stuffed animal dog, like maybe about almost three feet like it was it was pretty big uh and one you know time in the middle of the night it's hanging over the edge of my bed so I go to to pull it to you know bring it closer to me because it's hanging off the bed and when I go to to pull it something pulled back uh which would mean that it was like under my bed or below my bed or something <laughs> um so I just let it go and I dropped it and like rolled over all the way to the opposite end of my bed to get as far away from whatever pulled back um and i think a lot of it was just like i'm just going to pretend this didn't happen is why we were able to be okay with sleeping in the room and staying in there i, I don't know i'm speaking for you eric but i think that was my way of coping with it yeah i mean i i would i would assume like that's what it is it was just kind of just like oh well you know we're just imagining it or whatever when when the ladies that would help you know take care of us that lived in our in our house would start talking about things that they experienced then that's when it was kind of hard because again you're a kid you're hearing these things and you're like oh my god i've never experienced that but now you're terrified of going downstairs in the middle of the night you know did this happen both your encounters did this happen in the same house and around the same time oh yeah yeah yeah, around I mean, the same. I would say it was around the same time. Um, like all, because all throughout elementary kind of for you, years, yeah. Because yeah. I was by the when you were in elementary, I think I was already in middle school. But yeah, this is actually the house that I'm in right now is is the the childhood house that I grew up in. So this this is the same house. And yeah. is there anything that happens there now uh, when you're living there? Ah. Uh... <laughs> When I don't cleanse the house, it, it can happen. But there was a time where things were happening very much, um, like more, a lot more frequently. Um, it was actually I had to have Michelle come in and cleanse the house because uh, I, you know, now thinking back to it, it could have been like poltergeist esque activity. Um, I mean, there wasn't like stuff like constantly banging around the house but there was definitely energies that were felt like i would go like again downstairs for us was always kind of a taboo place to go to um just because of the stories that these ladies would tell us um you know hearing whistling uh or singing and uh seeing things uh our grandfather uh actually stayed in in the in one of the in the room downstairs for a for a little bit and he was very much into the occult and you know using ouija boards uh but for i'm assuming not very good things uh and uh growing up or what you know we never had a relationship with him but you know when my father was growing up he was very into dark things um so i don't know if that had anything to do with it uh, but Michelle at this point had already moved out of the house. Uh, she, she had gone to Austin. She moved. So we, I live in Brownsville again, which is, uh, at the very Southern tip of Texas, Michelle moved to Austin, which is about five and a half, six hours away. Um, and eventually my mother ended up 
moving up there as well. Uh, she was going to be retiring from her job down here and she wanted to make a change. So she ended up leaving and I, that's why I stayed in the house. And, you know, I was like, well, why get an apartment when, you know, you, got <laughs> got a house, house. you know, uh, but I would, I would always have these like just horrible, horrible nightmares, uh, horrible in the sense that they didn't feel like they were dreams or nightmares. They felt real. Uh, and they always happened in the house and I could, this was my room back then. And I had my bed on the, in the corner of the room, you know, uh, and in the dreams I would wake up and the bed would be shaking or I would be getting dre like, like if something was trying to pull me under the bed, uh, I remember one of them I was that that was happening in this room and I like jumped off the bed in the dream, uh, opened the door, ran to the other room and jumped into that bed. And then that bed started shaking. Um, <clears throat> I remember, I don't know if it was in that same dream or it might've been a different one where I saw my mother like walking down the stairs towards the, you know, all the way down to the, the first floor. And I remember running after her because I was going to tell her, you know, not to go down there because of whatever it was that was down there. And I get down there and she's not there. And the garage door was to my back. I turned to where the garage door was to my back and I saw the door to that room open. And then I kind of wanted to stand my ground and tell whatever it was that this isn't, you know, you can't do this. You can't, I'm not afraid of you type of thing. And I start walking towards the room and I just remember the door slamming shut. And when the door slammed shut, I kind of flew back and slammed up against the garage door and like fell forward. And I just remember being completely terrified at that point. I was trying to be brave, but when that happened, I got complete, I was completely terrified. And, um, I started praying the, our father, um, and I woke up, I, I woke up from the, the, the nightmare and these were dreams that were having like happening frequently. And I used, to, uh, so then I, it was when me and Michelle, well, Michelle started getting more into the like spiritual Metaphysical side, spiritual. Yeah, yeah. side of things. And she started, we were talking and, um, that's actually what kind of got me into the metaphysical, like spiritual side of things. And, uh, I told her, you know what, can you just come and do a cleansing of the house? And, uh, I feel like I'm going on forever now, but she came over and, uh, she started, uh, to cleanse the house. And I was walking around with her and she did some, uh, we did, uh, put, uh, some stones on the outside and the four corners of the home. And we did, she did everything and uh, we buried the ashes and that was, we did everything. Uh, we go up to the, to the, to the top floor of the house or the second floor of the house and kind of just sit in the living room. And uh, I remember my mom was sitting in a chair in front and to like, I guess we were in a circle triangle. She was uh, like kind of to my right. My Michelle was to my left. And you know, Michelle just started kind of doing a prayer and stuff like that. As we were sitting in the circle, I was sitting uh, with my legs crossed on the floor. And I just closed my eyes and I was kind of trying to uh, just concentrate, meditate, pray. And um, as Michelle is doing this prayer, she's telling me to imagine uh, these angels cleaning, cleaning my house, putting like a, a, a light throughout the house and taking away all the darkness. So I was doing that. And as I'm doing that, I was having trouble doing it uh, in the downstairs area in my head, you know? And then all of a sudden I just start feeling like a lot of weight on my shoulders. And I was physically like slouching. Yeah. And so I would straighten myself up and then she continued. And I remember just again, just my shoulders started to drop and I started to slouch forward as I'm trying to, you know, do this, that, you know, imagine this, that she was, what she was trying to tell me to imagine. And, uh, I don't remember if I started getting emotional before or after she started praying on me. I just remember having, and, like, and I remember telling her, I can't, like, I can't do the downstairs. And I, and like, she could see me kind of like slouching forward. Slouching, yeah. 
Yeah, and and so she starts preying on me, and as soon as she starts doing that, like I just start bawling. My I'm I, and I don't know where that emotion came from or what, but I just started crying and um it was very 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 intense uh once and then once i was she prayed over me i was able to finish that like you know clearing out the house and after that that was it i didn't have any more uh really bad experiences in the home or anything like that um so I don't know. I, I I know my like my wife has like felt certain things, and <laughs> I haven't cleansed the house in a while. So I was playing <laughs> I was playing video games recently, and I almost felt like somebody like I felt like somebody poked me in the like on the back. I haven't told her this, and I hope she's not. Doing it. <laughs> Don't tell so, her. <laughs> uh, so I probably need to cleanse very soon here. But uh, yeah, I mean, ever since Michelle cleansed the house, though. I haven't felt anything negative or super crazy uh, in the house. Do you know, I, I was going to ask earlier, um, you know, is there something special about that house? Or is it, you know, it's history or where it's located that would cause this to be happening in your house? But I think you pretty much answered it by saying that your, um, your grandfather uh, you yes. know, was dabbling <laughs> with in, like an Ouija board or something like that. Um, I mean, I don't care what anyone says. I, I definitely believe uh, that uh, the, the, the ph phenomenon of the Ouija board is a real thing. I've heard so mm. many stories from so many different people, even skeptics as well, who tried it just for a laugh. And I quote, for a laugh. Uh, they've had nothing but bad luck and uh, strange things happen in, uh, in their houses when it never used to happen there before. Um, but you mentioned some of the rituals. Uh, you know, to cleanse the house and, uh, and what have you. What are some of those rituals that you do? Uh, yeah, I mean, for, we were born and raised Catholic. I don't, I don't we're, we don't quite call ourselves Catholic um, or maybe watered down Catholic. Uh, so a lot of the prayers were just, yeah, like our fathers and, and whatnot. Um, but there is a lot of, I guess, just more intentional prayers as far as like uh bringing in only good or the only thing that can stay you know is like good higher vibrational beings or um beings of the light things like that anything else like is not welcome here needs to leave uh obviously uh, smoke cleansing is always whether it's palo santo or sage um and the the stones that we put were uh, black tourmaline on the four corners on the outside of the house for protection and then selenite inside on the four corners. Uh, well, again, also for cleansing as well. Um, and then I, I feel like when I started praying, like, I, and I'll be completely honest, like this was pretty early, not early, but felt pretty early in my trying to understand and, and learn, you know, some of these practices and whatnot. So Part of me felt like I had absolutely no idea what I was doing, especially when I started praying over Eric, but I just felt like something I could see. I mean, the way that his body was changing and then when he got emotional, I could see that something was happening. And I, so I just let the words come out and hopefully whatever I said made sense. And I mean, I think it did considering it, you know, really helped him. And, but I, I mean, I will admit, and I, I mean, we can, maybe it's psychological too, because <laughs> my grandfather stayed in that room, but there was something that like this heaviness that was always uh, in that room. And it wasn't until after this cleansing and they kind of cleaned out that, that space and stuff that it does feel much lighter now. It doesn't feel the the way it did before. Yeah. I suppose, yeah a lot of it does come down to, um, I'm a great believer in mind over matter to be fair. So, you know, if you, do you visualize some of the things that you do as well? Like one of the things I do that I visualize, if I wake up sometimes thinking that uh, there's something in the room with me or something like that, and I don't, I can't explain why sometimes, not very often, but why sometimes I feel like that. And it's always after three o'clock in the morning. Um, I always visualize that there's a white, like a golden white light emanating from my heart area and just pushes out uh, any shadows or, or things that I visualize in the room uh, and keeps them out. And mm -hmm. then I, I feel fine again. Um, mm -hmm. are, are you uh, accustomed to doing that as well? Or th is that an irregular practice of yours? 
I mean, for me, when I'm cleansed, when I cleanse, uh, I usually do like the smoke. And then I'll sit in a room and uh, wherever the last room is that I'm that I'm cleansing, I'll usually sit in that room or sit in that space and continue to pray. And again, do that uh, imagine picturing uh, that that light, you know, going throughout the entire house, just clearing out any negative negativity or darkness. But it, it is definitely that where you imagine this coming f- either from you or is in your surroundings. Um, but yeah, I definitely feel, cause I've done it. Like, I know it sounds kind of strange. Cause I'm uh, so I'm a nurse. Um, but there have been instances where I have prayed over a patient or just, you know, just been in that and like kind of just touched their head or something like that. And uh, so another thing that we were kind of, Michelle kind of got me into, I guess, was uh, the different archangels, and each one has a different, I guess, represents something different. Uh, so for me, Raphael, uh, or not for me, but he's a healer. So as a nurse, that's that's always an angel that I, I pray to or I call on to help me uh, or guide me if need, or if I need to or or whatever it is to protect my patients sometimes if they're going to be going in for a procedure and I'll imagine a, a green light because that the, that color is closely associated with, with him. So uh, I'll do that and imagine a green light either coming from me or just covering my patient as I'm trying to, uh, you know, meditate or pray over them. I suppose but, the green uh, color sort of is no coincidence that it relates to like the healthcare profession as well. A lot of the times you see like mm-hmm. pharmacies or first aid kits have got the green cross on it, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah. green is uh, you know, is associated with that, isn't it? So uh, yeah, that, that's an interesting thought actually. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, sorry, were you going to say something there, Michelle? No, no. I, I I think. Uh, yeah, no, go ahead. No, <laughs> no, it's fine. Uh, no, it's fine. It's just, um, I, f- I just find things like this fascinating, especially when it relates um, to your profession as well. Um, mm-hmm. Like being a nurse. Now, I, I have an ex-girlfriend who is, um, she lives down in Dublin and she's like a healthcare assistant. So one step down from a nurse is, is what I would say. Mm-hmm. And um, she and another nurses, actual nurses who I know, um, have told me when somebody's approaching the end of their life, uh, you know, they're about to die for whatever reason. Uh, people have said that they've um, they've seen the patient talking or smiling to people at the end of their beds or in the room with them, you know, people who aren't there. And they'll ask, and they'll, who are you speaking to? Or, you know, uh, who are you smiling at? And they'll often say, oh, you know, my, my mother and father's uh, standing there waiting for me. Or I'm talking uh, to my son who died, you know, X amount of years ago. Um, have you ever come across anything like this, just out of interest? Yeah, actually, yeah. One of my other stories is, I so I used to work in a nursing home. Um, and... Uh, there was a patient whose husband, they were both in the nursing home. Her husband had just passed away, I think, maybe a few weeks or maybe even a couple months prior to that. And uh, the other nurse that was working with me, uh, was it was her patient. So she was in there uh, with the lady talking to her. And this lady, for some reason, even though the, the gentleman had already passed away, she would always get upset with the nurse and start telling her things because she thought that her and her husband, the nurse and her husband were, you know, doing things that they weren't supposed to be doing and stuff. So she was very jealous of this nurse. Um, so I don't know why the, one day this nurse walks in there and I was in the uh, like a little closet next to the room getting out some uh, f- like meat and milks, uh, some formulas for our patients who took their feedings through G-tube. Um, and uh, she comes out and I, and I asked her jokingly, I was like, oh, what did she tell you now? And she goes, oh, well, I asked her about her husband and uh, she said that he was here, like in the facility. And she's like, oh, he's, he's here. He's walking around. He's just working. And that she was like, um, okay. And, um, as she's like telling me this story, uh, uh, in the room across the hall from this lady's room, 
I see this like kind of shadow figure, like a person, but like a person, like I could see a person walking out of the room. And I, I just remember kind of like, I just got goosebumps thinking about it again. (laughs) I turned around and, um, and saw this, I guess, figure, but as I'm turning and I'm starting to get a clear visual of, of whatever it was that was coming out of the room, uh, the nurse jumps towards me terrified as well so I turned back and I was like well did you see it and she goes no but I saw your face and that was enough for me <laughs> and uh mind you the two the two men that were in that room um uh, neither one of them like walked on their own they needed assistance to get out of bed so it's not like it could have been one of them um and I think over the the next week or two we ended up having three patients pass away so like kind of putting everything together, I almost feel like her or his job or what he was doing for work was kind of like picking up some of the other patients. And I know like in our profession, uh, at least when I was working in the nursing home, anytime a patient would pass away, we were always ready for two more to go because they are they typically went in threes. Uh, three is a magic number so, as well as what they say, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Um, and a lot of things in the supernatural happen in threes, doesn't it? Um, uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's weird how how numbers uh, can have an effect on things as well. It, it really does. Fan- I mean, I've got goosebumps just listening to your story. <laughs> you know, uh, these things really, really fascinate me. They really do. Um, I suppose a question for Michelle actually that I can mm-hmm. sort of think of. Like, I'm aware you've been reading up on this subject over the years and no doubt watched various television programs and had several experiences of your own. But what would be the most surprising or, I suppose, memorable thing about the supernatural that you've learned? Oh, that I know nothing. The more that the more (laughs) questions I try and answer, I come up with 20 20 new ones. Um, I, I think... I think that it's uh, that's a great question. I mean, it's really picking your brains, like uh, you know, it's it's go, it's going yeah. deep. Yeah. But uh, even, <laughs> no, well, even what you've it... said, yeah, you know, sorry, I'll, yeah. You know, sorry to interrupt, but even what you've said <laughs> that uh, the more I think about it, the more I realize uh, I don't know. I mean, that, that yeah. speaks wonders for itself. But sorry, what were you saying? No, I mean, I, I guess just that, that it's, it's somehow it seems so close, like you could reach out and touch it, but it's, it's like a tease, like you, you can't ever get anything answered. And, and it's almost like, but it, it's, it's right there, like, people are experiencing these things are having similar experiences, things that we can't explain, but we can't get science to, to back it, because it's just, there's no rhyme or reason, or, you know what I mean? And, and it's almost frustrating, but um, that same sense of like wonder and curiosity that I had as a kid, like it's, it's very much still there. And maybe that's why I enjoy it so much is, is there is a little bit of <laughs> feeding that inner child and, and letting that imagination come out to play. Um, but now I guess with more adult ideas, as far as like physics and interdimensional things and, you know, uh, new ideas and topics that I wouldn't have even considered or thought about as a child. Yeah. I mean, uh... Yeah, so you were saying about science there, you know, the sort of try, the, the thing with science nowadays in particular, they tend to try and avoid things that they can't explain or, or don't understand. You know, they're afraid to touch it, you know, and I guess that could be because, um, you know, a lot of people tend to be scared of things they can't see or understand. Um, but is there anything that either of you, you know, find to be particularly scary when it comes to, uh, you know, the paranormal and objects or even the unseen i suppose i uh i think for me i don't know if it's again those like catholic roots that have just are so ingrained um the thing that always terrifies me the most that i don't even want to play with or like watch movies of are exorcist like exorcist movies or anything where of people being possessed and um again and doing research and whatnot part of me is like oh okay probably just had seizures and they you know trying to come up with some reasonable explanations but uh, you know going into like a haunted house that that they have here in Austin that we can they have different themes I guess um 
and one of them was like an exorcist kind of style theme. And I'm like, I can't bring myself to go in there for some reason. That I, I used to be terrified of dolls as well, but that's something that I've kind of embraced. And I have a creepy doll sitting, and she, I think she's lovely. Um, <laughs> Just get that out there. Like, she, she thinks yeah. you're nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I feel like exorcisms just always kind of. I don't I don't want to I hate I hate hearing audio of exorcisms happening like it just there's something about it that I, I a line that I don't want to cross with that I think you yeah. know it's, it's funny that you say that because uh, I was talking to you earlier about my friend Fra who runs Shadow Hunters Northern Ireland and you know uh, one of the things I told you about the doll that was in the sort of glass dome there and he made me hold it yeah. and all that sort of stuff but on the same evening uh, and you've just triggered this memory as well. Um, he showed me uh, a video of uh, an actual exorcism of a woman down in Dublin. I think you would love to see wow. that. It, it was. It I was don't a know. weird. It's, it's not. It's not like. It's not like what you would see in the movies. It. It, well, it wasn't like that. And this was shot on like a mobile phone. It was recorded on it. And uh, I'll give you a basic sort of scenario of what was happening. Was this uh, woman standing in a gown? And she was making all these weird grunts and noises and she had this really hoarse voice. And in one hand she was carrying a crucifix and the other hand was a lit cigarette. And uh, she was, I can't remember what she was saying, but I think uh, her son was recording it. And the priest has been saying to the son, don't look at her in the eyes. Uh, and, oh. and I asked Fra what that was about. It's, he says that's how you sort of um, uh, demons can transfer from one body to another. And uh, yeah. she turned and looked at the camera and her face deformed. Uh, there was no special oh, effects or anything like that. No. It deformed. Um, and then no. the video the video stopped. And I, I asked him, I goes, well, have you followed up on this? You know, uh, what, what's what's the fallout from this? And he hasn't heard anything since uh, from it. And it was a really... Now, I'm not normally sort of uh, disturbed by videos and, uh, and things like that you know I, I mean i can watch a horror um you know just as well as the next guy as a matter of fact there used to be a tv program here called um uh, anatomy for beginners and it was this german doctor in this black hat and he would dissect dead bodies and he would give you lessons and i could be sitting watching that as a teenager scrambling my dinner as i'm watching it. so i'm not <laughs> normally disturbed by these sort of things but that video itself what i saw in it was uh it, it, it kept me awake that night, if I'm honest. It really, really did. Ugh, it, no. it genuinely yeah. did. But, um, um, wow. Eric, what, what about you? Is there um, anything that you find to be particularly scary when it comes to uh, the paranormal? I think I think it's just... Uh, because of the experiences that I've had, it's just been difficult for me to kind of... So Michelle's been... Michelle's tried... Uh, and and I've I like I want to do this, but I'm I'm always very apprehensive about it. Uh, is just trying to open my mind more or so I I do I don't I never call myself anything psychic medium nothing like that, but I do tend to see a lot of things. I tend to hear things, and uh, sometimes. I've been touched multiple times, uh, you know, in the back or on the shoulder or things like that when nobody is around. So for me, that's always kind of unsettling. Um, and I've always wanted to be able to do that more or be able to do it m and, and be able to see like better, I guess, or hear better. Um, but it's just my, my fear would be like, turning it off yeah and i think ouija boards uh, she's also <laughs> talked to me about uh, uh doing that and again growing up catholic we we heard the oh the ouija board is evil and this and that and i i've changed my mind as far as it being evil but But you, your intent is when you're using it. And uh, like I've, I've mentioned on our podcast multiple times, I could probably go in there with the best of intentions, you know, but I have very intrusive thoughts. And uh, once we're using the board, I'm afraid that I'm going to start thinking things that I shouldn't be thinking or thinking about, you know, certain things that I shouldn't be thinking and then have those things come through. So, uh and and it's not, like once my 
my brain starts going, it's it's hard for me to to stop it from thinking <laughs> those things. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I think with most people, the thing that scares them most of all uh, is definitely the Ouija board, isn't it? It's uh, Ouija board is not something that I've tried. I don't think it's something that I would want to try, if I'm honest. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, it's something that I tend to avoid as well. It's not. It's. An, uh, I guess it's. It's not a case of being afraid of it so much. It's more. Um, I've heard the rumors about it. I'm a little bit apprehensive. <laughs> Is the best yeah. way to is the yeah. best way to describe it. Um, do you know? I, I've said earlier on that um, I I was in Austin before, and it, it is an amazing, vibrant city. It it really is. Surely it must be home to some unusual things and paranormal happenings. Um, is there anywhere in Austin that like sort of stands out to you for paranormal reasons, or even if? Um, someone were to go to Austin to experience something paranormal, where would you recommend? Yeah, uh, it's it's funny. For my 30th birthday, we were actually supposed to go to Ireland and the trip got postponed because of uh, COVID. So instead, my boyfriend set up a private tour in a hearse to go around Austin to visit a whole bunch of uh, haunted locations. So that was an experience. It wasn't quite Ireland, but it was pretty great. <laughs> um, it was and probably drier we than went... Ireland, to be fair. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, very much, very much so, yeah. Um, but there is there's a few places there. Um, there there's a, a hotel downtown uh, called the Driscoll, and that is supposedly very haunted. There's, a, I guess, a legend of a little girl who dropped her ball down this huge staircase that, that they have there. Um, and in trying to run after it, she fell down those stairs, broke her neck, and now sometimes you'll see like a phantom ball rolling down the, the steps. Um, I know that the, I can't remember his first name, but basically the, the person who um, built the hotel, he's, there's a huge portrait uh, painted of him, like right at the entrance that you can, you know, see. Uh, he apparently walks through the halls, you can smell like tobacco, things like that. Um, there's uh, actually a, a tavern that we also visited that apparently there is a ghost and there's actually a paranormal, another paranormal podcast located here in Austin that, that kind of covered this space, but uh, a little girl who her, her mother was uh, a lady of the night, I guess I should say. And there is this uh, man who wanted to marry her and like wanted to whisk her away and like get her out of that life. And she was, she wanted nothing to do with him. So in a, a jealous rage, um, he he killed her and the daughter. And they actually found the shoes of the little girl in between the walls when they were doing the renovations. And so it said that she and her mother um, haunt the place. But the, or at least in the in this podcast that that I was listening to, apparently they don't. They're almost like not in the same plane, so they can't actually be together. The the mother and the daughter. Um, like they know that each other is there, but they can't. Yeah. So it's like super sad, <laughs> I guess. Um, and there's this other darker entity that hangs, hangs around there kind of in the, in the shadows. And, um, yeah, the, the, I believe the podcast is the night owl podcast, <gasps> the night owl podcast, if anyone wants to listen to that, but there, there is, uh, I will say this one last place that I personally felt something i guess it's it's a place called pioneer farms um and it's this uh, plot of land that they've actually brought older ho uh, homes from kind of all over the united states but you know 18th century kind of uh, old homes and have put them on this land but this land was actually a place where um this one specific native american tribe used to i guess migrate to and would come because it was by a creek and the land was was great and whatnot so I think that has a little bit to do with it. Uh, but I remember, I can't remember what we were, I was there for. It was not any sort of paranormal sort of situation, but I remember this one building kind of almost seeing, I guess with my third eye, because um, I, I knew he wasn't there, but I could almost envision uh, a type of man with like suspenders and a, a specific type of hat, um, I guess kind of like the Peaky Blinders, whatever, like the Paperboy hats, I think is what they're called. Um, and he had a very distinct look and I was like, I, I don't know why I'm seeing this guy in the door frame and I didn't think anything of it and whatever went on with the tour, whatever it is that we did. 
And we finally got to that building and we went inside uh, and there is a, like a horse and carriage or the carriage portion of it. Um, and on that carriage was one of those paper boy hats uh, and a picture of a man in suspenders, like with the hat, basically what I had been seeing before I actually went into the building. Um, there is a photo of that type of man there, basically. So I'm like, I don't know what that, because like Eric, I don't think that I'm, a psychic or a medium or have any sort of special abilities or anything uh, other than maybe sensitivities to feeling like someone's in the room or feeling like someone's watching you like those kinds of things but this time I felt like I could see but not with my physical eyes if that makes sense but yeah so it sounds like Austin is no short of places <laughs> to be oh, going there's to visit so many, when, it comes, yeah. uh, when it comes to that um it, it, it intrigues me that you were able to like a sort of a foresight before you went into that building and you'd seen this in your mind uh the, the image of that man that was in there um that sort of stuff intrigues me as well um i can't even come up with an explanation for it, it it's just it is <laughs> definitely unexplained you know um but We'll talk a little bit about your podcast, actually, now uh, that I think about it. So your podcast has been in existence now since uh, late 2020, am I correct? Yes. Uh, yes. Either way, you know, from the time of recording this, you've no less than 151 episodes uh, on <laughs> on your site, which is uh, an amazing achievement in itself. And you've no doubt interviewed several people over these years. And uh, are there any of those stories that made you think, wow, or something that you find particularly chilling or memorable uh, from your guests? Mm. Oh, yeah. it's just, there's, <laughs> we've interviewed so many people. It's just, it's, um, I think for me, I, I feel like, Mich like I, and I always say this and she always, <laughs> she always feels like that's not the case, but I, she's just knows so much more. I think she just like listens to so many podcasts and just like goes deep diving into different topics. So she knows like she has a plethora of knowledge on different things, spiritual, uh, you know, aliens, UFOs, everything, cryptids. Uh, and for me, this, this podcast, you know, is I get to learn. So, um, I think a couple of the, the the guests that have impacted me the most just by what they were taught, like what, what they were speaking about, not necessarily maybe the experience that they may have had, which they did have experiences where it were that were also very uh, in like uh, hard to explain and, and very impactful. But uh, there was a guest, our, uh, Craig Lefebvre, uh, when the I, I remember the we had we had to cut his episode into a two parter because I think we went for like three hours with him. Yeah. Um, God damn. My head <laughs> hurt. Yeah. Yes, yeah. my head hurt at the end of the 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 recording. Not because we went for so long, but just everything that basically then they they were both discussing. I was just kind of silent for most of it because I I had no idea what they were talking about and I was just trying to absorb everything that they were saying. Um, and then I think the other guest that we had on that kind of had the same effect on me was, uh, Wajid. Um, mm. he, uh, also brought up some topics very similar to Craig's, but, uh, that also kind of just blew my mind. And those, for me, those are the episodes that are very impactful to me, very like, because I'm learning things and, and, um, yeah, uh, I mean, I, I would I would agree. I when when you asked that question, the, the first two people that kind of popped into my head were also Craig and and Majid. So I can second uh, those. And and I think the reason they're so interesting were was they were bringing in topics that we hadn't really thought about or discussed yet. Uh, you know, it, uh, I feel like it was he was probably one of our first like alien experiencers. Yeah. Oh, yeah, oh, yes, Craig, yes, Craig. Yeah, yeah. Craig first and then Wajid and and that's when I think I kind of took a cue of like oh wait I, I forgot how much I enjoyed you know aliens and UFOs and things like that and um kind of 
gone down those rabbit holes as well again. But I, I would I would agree with Eric as as Craig and and Wajid. If anybody would like to go listen to what they had to say. Uh, definitely. Um, um, I'll be posting uh, a link to your podcast in uh, our show notes. <clears throat> so you should have, um, hopefully a few people, uh, gone over and d- discovering you for the first time. Because uh, uh, some of the accounts uh, that I've listened to on there so far, um, I can't, I'm, I'm not going to claim that I've listened to all of them. But 151 is, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> is a lot to get through. But I've listened to quite a few of them. And uh, you, you've had some really interesting people there. Um there are no doubt a load of sceptics out there who would try to poo-poo and debunk anything paranormal. Um, have you ever yeah. encountered this? And if so, uh, or I guess even if you haven't, uh, how would you deal with um, scepticism or criticism from others? I feel I, like... I think... Are we <laughs> thinking of the same guest or what? Or... Oh, uh, no. I, I, I don't know if you were talking about in our personal life or on the show. Uh, oh. Either or. I mean, if it, um, if you were talking to people about some of your personal encounters and um, people, uh, you know, they may do so, you must be drunk or, you know, that stuff doesn't happen. Yeah. Or even from people mm-hmm. on the show as well. You know, that how how do you how would you best deal with the sort of um, skepticism or the negative response or, or criticism from others? I, I think for me personally, I I won't share unless I feel safe enough that like the you know the other person I'm talking to is willing to have an open mind about it. Um, but I I, I guess I'm, I'm distinctly remembering this one um, this one guest that we had on in particular that later on we realized like he was coming for a fight or like a debate of some kind to try and you know say like this is bullshit and like have us be angry about it. Uh, I mean, he still came on and, and talked about his topic and we we're super open-minded and like, we're like, yeah, like what, what do you have to share? Uh, and I think that taking that approach of like, listen, you're going to believe what you believe. I'm going to believe what I believe. As long as you're not being too much of an asshole, like I'm not going to try and change your, sorry, there I go with the colorful language. <laughs> no, you can crack on. Uh, I mean, it makes it more entertaining yeah. to be fair. <laughs> Yeah, like as as long as, you know, people can respect or be respectful, I'll, you know, we'll hear them out as long as they're, and, and, you know, hopefully they will hear us out as well. But um, it's just about having an open mind and taking things with a grain of salt and uh, allowing people to share and not, not be a jerk about it. Uh, there's definitely been guests that we had on that I've been like, you know, I don't really align with this, uh, but that's okay. Um and just kind of move on from there. Um, but yeah, I think just kind of just be kind and, and be open minded and be careful of what you're sharing with who you're, you know, who you're sharing it with. Yeah. I, I think with that guess too, it was kind of ironic that he had uh, ideas about what we believed when some of the stuff that he was sharing and believed. And I don't think we, we really challenged it. Uh, I think after the fact, it was like, why, why didn't we challenge him on this? Cause the thing is, we're not trying to debate people either. We're, we're, we're you know, we, our podcast is more about giving people a platform to share their experiences. And that's why Michelle exactly. said, like when, yeah. when people have come on and we don't really agree with what they're saying, we'll either try and okay let's move on from this and go somewhere else or just let them speak and okay once that's done you know let's continue you know with something else you know because we don't want to put anybody down uh i guess the way that we feel is everybody has had an experience and we can't say whether that experience was real or not you know because for that person that experience was very real so right there yeah. So that's why, and, and it was like ancient civilizations and what he, what he was bringing up and how the, like some people are pre- trying to present information, but they're being basically blackballed by the like uh, communities or the, like that, that actually do research into these uh, old civilizations and how that it's not alien. Anyway, uh, <laughs> So our like I guess the way I feel about it or the way I think about it is like Michelle said, I usually try not to share things with people who I don't feel comfortable with. Uh or if maybe if they start sharing, then I'll share. 
Uh, but if I ever do come across somebody who is just explaining everything away and okay, I mean, that's valid. You can, it's, excuse me, it's always good to be a little skeptical and stuff like that. Um, but if that's the case and they're just like shooting everything down that I'm saying, and, uh, you know, I don't need them to validate my experience. And so if they want to continue to do that and just not really listen to what I'm saying, or they're like, Oh, well, it was, this is all BS. This is all, you know, whatever. I'm just like, all right, well, I just, I'll stop sharing with that person and, and move on. Like they're, they're entitled to their opinion. Again, I know what I experienced. Uh, I know what state of mind I was in and, and yes, I'm a, I am like, again, I am a nurse. So I know they're like when people are talking about, Oh, I'm going to pray the cancer away. Well, I know that's not going to happen, you know, but it's, we're also very healthy. I feel like skeptics. So when we see a video, we're not automatically automatically going to hundred percent believe that that video that we just saw is real. We're going to try and watch the video multiple times and see if there's a way that we can explain what we're seeing in that video. You know, my favorite, my favorite thing to do is when, especially some of our listeners will send us like, Oh, did you see this creepy video? I'm like, all right, like let's debunk it. And I, I love that they are sending us these weird videos, but sometimes honestly, they're so creepy for my own peace of mind. I have to debunk it and make sure that it's not, you know, something else. So yeah, as much as, yeah, like Eric was saying, as much as we want to believe we're very much still skeptics, uh, but we also know that there's something unexplained happening and, you know, we don't have the answers to it, but it's there. I mean, of course you have to. I mean, you've experienced it firsthand, uh, even um, as, as children in, in the family mm-hmm. home. And I suppose, you know, uh, s- some people uh, won't, just won't understand you because they themselves haven't went through it, you know, and uh, mm-hmm. it's a shame that, um, you know, unless something happens to them, uh, things like that are impossible, you know. It's, it, it really is mm-hmm. a shame. Um We've just about reached an hour now and we'll begin to start wrapping it up. But before we do, um, are there, you know, over the years that you've been interested in the paranormal and researching it and engaging with it, um, has it influenced your take on life in any way? And are there any lessons that you've learned over the years that uh, if somebody was just starting out in the paranormal, you know, whether investigating it or moved into a, a house with the same sort of, uh, goings on that you've had. So any advice that you would give them based on your experience uh, over the years? Um, I would, I would say be respectful uh, because I, yeah, we, we talked about ghost adventures briefly and that show bothers me quite a bit. Um, just almost because like of the way Zach Baggins. He's looking to pick a fight uh, with, with some of them, isn't it? You know, <laughs> It's uh, what it's like, yeah, yeah, and so that always kind of gets on my nerves. Or, or if people are like trespassing into these places because they think it like anything disrespectful like that. Um, I don't know. I would say you know treat treat the paranormal whether you can see them or not. You know, as if they're humans. Like be be kind, be respectful. I, I don't. I wouldn't want an attachment coming home with me. So why are you trying to, you know, egg these things on? Um, and and just be be smart about especially in Texas people, uh, everyone has guns, guns. and firearms. <laughs> so if you're trespassing or trying to sneak into places, you, you could get hurt not because of a ghost but because of human beings. Um, I mean, so just be smart that's a fair about point. yeah, yeah. Just just be smart about where you're going if you're going to investigate. Uh, get permission and most importantly, be kind and respectful to people, but also the spirits. Um, yeah yeah i i would probably say just intentions matter so yeah. and and i'm i'm speaking uh also um like just go in with good intentions like don't go in there uh you know be like Michelle said, I, I guess it falls into the be respectful kind of thing. Just, you know, go in, in with good intentions, uh, anything that you're doing, uh, you know, just always try and put a positive vibe out. Um, if you believe in that, or if you want to, <laughs> however you want to take that. Um, and also like, if you are trying to get into investigating or just in paranormal in general, 
a good dose of skepticism is is fine necessary it's, it's, yes because again like and i know you mentioned this on our podcast a little while ago you know there's people out there that 100 believe everything that they see all the time and that's that's not that's not good either because that doesn't help you know uh further either field you know the in the ufo community in the ghost community whatever the you know whatever it is just 100 percent and I really, like, well, I'm not going to go there. Uh, just 100%, <laughs> 100% blindly believing in things is not good. Uh, you, you have to question things. And that's the only way that I feel that we're going to uh, further any, any of these communities uh, is by questioning things. Um, and I, I am very thankful to um, a lot of the paranormal investigators that we've had on who have kind of had that same mentality. And I think we've also kind of picked up on that from them and, and, you know, you know, adopted that as well. I always feel like we were kind of that way, but it just speaking with them kind of just really solidified that for us. And, and so that would be my advice or, or, you know, what I want people to know about, about this. It's just your, your intentions matter. And, you know, uh, just, it's, it's, it's okay. And it's good to be a little skeptical, you know? Uh, it is. Yeah. I mean, uh, t- take the middle ground is, is how I approach it. And, uh, my investigators uh, approach it as well. And I suppose, yes, in Texas, um, be respectful, uh, particularly in people's yes. property. Otherwise, you'll get a face full of lead or perhaps a ghost uh, following you home. Yeah. I don't know which is worse, actually, <laughs> if I'm, yeah, if I'm right. honest. Um, but, you know, yeah, the, yeah, the, the, the food for thought, food for thought. Um, yeah. Michelle, Eric, uh, thank you so much for being on the show. Um, before you go, uh, where can our listeners uh, find and follow you? Uh, so we do have a website. It's webelievedu.com. Uh, we also have a Facebook page, which is the same. We believe to you. Doc, or, I'm sorry. We believe to you. And uh, on Instagram as well. We do have a Twitter, but like we don't ever post on there anymore. So just yeah, Facebook and Instagram. Me. And uh, our website, you can listen to the podcast on the website or any a major podcast listening site. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Eric and Michelle Connor, all the way from Austin in Texas and hosts of yes. the we believe the you podcast uh, listen you two thank you so much for being on the show have a great rest of the day because i know it should just be starting for you over there and i definitely yes. look forward to speaking to you both soon yes thank you yes, appreciate thank you what a way to see in the new year and get back to podcasting a very interesting conversation was had with this uh, excellent brother and sister team uh, michelle and eric connor very very good uh, indeed and i do hope to speak to them in the not too distant future because it does sound like they've got a lot of stuff to tell and uh, I, again uh, i would recommend you to go check out their uh, podcast series um we believe do you i've listened to a handful of episodes already and i must say Uh, The content is excellent. So, uh, what have we got coming up in the next episode? Well, I will talk with publisher Damien Dumar and the book uh, The Last Harvest. And uh, it might be a little bit uncomfortable uh, for people to listen to. It goes a little bit dark and explains how the uh, human population will face a cull at the hands of malevolent ETs. You don't want to miss this one. Uh, Listen, you've been listening to the Close Encounters podcast with me, Chris McMurray, and until next episode, have a good week.